All right, so our first talk today, I'm going to be talking about ISIS. All right, so we're going to go international, domestic, international, domestic. ISIS, also known as the Islamic State, also known as IS or ISIL. They have an acronym problem, a naming problem. Um, but this is the group that over the last four or five years has seized territory in both Iraq and Syria to establish their own little governing unit. And um, you're, you're probably aware of ISIS from some of the headlines. So they're always in the news, right? So for some brutality, some act, some act of aggression, either some beheading or they're carrying out an attack or they've blown up some ancient temple. It's hard to find somebody who has something nice to say about ISIS. Uh, even Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda broke up with ISIS. Right? And that says something when Al-Qaeda says, you've just, you're just gone too far. Think about that phone conversation. Right? When, when Al-Qaeda calls up ISIS and says, uh, hey ISIS, it's, uh, it's Al-Qaeda. We, we, we can't be friends anymore. Uh, <laughs> why? Well, you've just you've gone too far. You're too extreme. You've crossed lines that we can't go anymore. So, so we're, we're somewhat aware of the headlines and what's transpired. And I'm guessing that for most of you, You've never felt the desire to hop on a plane and go to Iraq or Syria and join the fight, right? Uh, and I would say that's a majority of Americans and a majority of Muslims, right? ISIS represents a tiny fraction of the world. But that being said, they're a very, very interesting and fascinating element. Because what's happening is that even though they're criticized for being barbaric and, you know, a throwback to a previous age, they're appealing and their numbers are growing. And that's what I want to talk about today, is trying to understand that appeal, the growth of ISIS, and why certain individuals around the world are gravitating toward this organization. Now, the numbers are fairly telling. So if you look at this, they're pulling from all over the world. The New York Times came out with a report last week saying that uh, ISIS has now recruited upwards of 30,000 foreign fighters to Iraq and Syria. That represents a doubling in about the last year, 250 of which are from the United States. Again, this represents something unique, something different, where ISIS is able to draw and pull in individuals literally from all corners of the world. And when you look at, actually, they also have passports now as well. ISIS is, they're, they're, not, they're not good anywhere, uh, but they have them. And I think what's maybe most striking is that when you look at the pictures of those that ISIS is able to recruit from traditionally Western countries, from the United States, from Canada, from Australia. Let's look through a couple here. I'm guessing these don't look like what you would consider to be terrorists, right? You wouldn't say, no, 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 that, that can't be ISIS. But again, it is. And what I'd like us to do is think more about this and the question of why. Why is this group so appealing? What's the psychological appeal? Um, how are they being so effective at recruiting? Now, CNN has offered their theory for why ISIS is so effective. Um, they're luring with uh, kittens, uh, Nutella, and emojis. And to be honest, you know, at the end of the day, who doesn't want more kittens, more, more Nutella, and uh, more emojis? But I don't, I don't have a lot of faith in this explanation. Now, what I think is more interesting is that, of course, CNN has this wonderful news break, and ISIS doesn't miss a beat, right? They're out the next day, and you literally have members of ISIS with their Nutella. Right, uh, and with their cats uh, talking about this and not with the, you know, okay, uh, talking about their appeal. And it shows how tech savvy they are. And I think that's an important dialogue here, an important angle to say that ISIS is using 21st century technology uh, to make an argument to return to a 7th century interpretation of Islam. I want to go back to this picture and talk specifically about this, this gentleman in the middle. He's from Canada. And once he arrived in Syria, he was there for a while, and he made a recruitment video, a video that I'm going to show in just a second. It's a short video, about two minutes, and the first part of the video is him talking about who he is as an individual. And I'm guessing you're going to see him and identify with him, say, hey, he's, he seems like me. He's going to talk about playing hockey, right? You don't think about ISIS and hockey. Uh, and then, and toward the uh, second part of the video, you're going to see him in battle. He's ultimately killed, and this becomes a recruitment video. Uh, but it's very indicative of the type of approach that ISIS uses. So let's, let's watch. I was like any other 
regular Canadian. I watched hockey, I went to the cottage in the summertime, I loved to fish, I wanted to go hunting, I liked outdoors, I liked sports. I had money, I had a family, I had good friends, I had colleagues. You know, I worked as a, as a street janitor. I made over $2,000 a month at this job. So it's not like I was some social outcast. Uh, it wasn't like I was some anarchist or somebody who just wants to destroy the world and kill everybody. No, I was a regular person. My brothers, how can you answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you live on the same street, when you're using their lights and you're paying taxes to them and, to, and they use these taxes to assist their war on Islam? There's a role for everybody. Every person can contribute something to the Islamic State as it's obligatory on us. If you cannot fight, then you can give money. And if you cannot give money, then you can uh, assist in technology, uh, technology. And if you can't assist in technology, you can use some other skills. You can even come here and, and help rebuild the, the place. If you have knowledge of how to build roads or how to build houses, you could be used here. And you would be take, uh, uh, very well t uh, taken care of here. You know, you can easily earn yourself a high station with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the next life by sacrificing just a small bit of this worldly life. The trade is a very good trade. You know, it's like trading something worthless for the most precious diamond in the world. He eagerly pledged allegiance to the Islamic State, seeking to play a role in reviving the Khilafah, until he witnessed the battle for the military airport of Minir. He moved during the battle like a man who did not know death. Rather, he knew that true life awaited him and it was only a matter of being struck down by the weapons of the Kuffar. He was a brother who would be pleased with the bare minimum and still shine with happiness. <laughs> All right, what we see here is that ISIS is something fundamentally different than what we've known before. So when, we think, when you think of terrorism and your conventional understanding of terrorism, we generally think of Al-Qaeda, right, and the structure of Al-Qaeda. It's a loose organization, decentralized. You have lots of cells all over the place, and those individual cells are supposed to carry out tax. ISIS is suggesting or, or trying to formulate something fundamentally different. They're trying to build a community. They're trying to create an Islamic state. And that goal and those ambitions require a very, very different approach, a very different psychological approach when you think about trying to recruit for individual attacks and trying to recruit to build a community. They're thinking about infrastructure, they're thinking about building roads, schools, uh, health care, in addition to waging an ideological battle uh, with the rest of the world, right? So it's a very, very different approach. And when you think again, another contrast with Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda was a very modern political force. They had modern political goals. Uh, Mohammed Atta, one of the guys who carried out the attacks on 9-11, the day before the attack, he went to Walmart and he had dinner at Pizza Hut. Right? I don't think ISIS, I don't think there are any Pizza Huts in the Islamic State right now. And again, this is, this is important and it helps us understand the approach and the appeal of this organization. ISIS is trying to throw us back to take us back in history. Their appeal is to, to revert all the way back to a seventh century interpretation of Islam. And they say that's how you understand what's going on in the world, or that's how you understand how to find a sense of purpose in life. Again, very, very different. They're anti-modernists. They're anti the modern world. Uh, and you can think about this. In many ways, there's some parallels with those who study constitutional law in the United States, the originalist. Right? There are those who say you study the original context, you study the Constitution, it doesn't evolve, it doesn't change. That's the document you look at. That's what ISIS is doing. They're going back in time to say you study the time of the Prophet Muhammad, you study those documents, those ideas, you go back in history. And so that's why you see the beheadings, that's why you see the public executions, the, the reinstatement of slavery, because you're going back in time to when those ideas had value. So again, something very, very different than Al-Qaeda. Uh, now there are those who criticize ISIS to say that it's un-Islamic. And while that may be accurate, I don't know if it's an effective critique of ISIS. I don't think they care. 
You know, religions are big tent parties. There are lots of different groups that have very different interpretations of their faith. And, is, and ISIS argues that they have a more pure interpretation of Islam. And again, so we're thinking about the psychological appeal of this organization. They make individuals feel comfortable in a couple ways. You think about their messaging and their packaging and their media department. And yes, they have a media department that puts these videos out, trying to connect with individuals all across the globe at different levels. And the appeal is to two different things. One, to give you a sense of identity, give you a sense of certainty, truth, answers in life, right? So you look around the world and it's a very complicated place. ISIS argues they can give you answers, they can give you coherence, they can give you a sense of purpose. And they also say that you can have some individual significance. That all you have to do is join ISIS. If you make it to Iraq or Syria, you can go out and you can change the world. So that psychological appeal is very, very powerful. Gives you a sense of certainty about life, gives you answers to life's questions, and gives you an individual purpose and a way to confront those, those goals. So this is a very, very seductive and very strategic and very 21st century marketing approach. And it's not the first time that it's been done. Uh, Dr. Caliendo is going to tweet something out from the North Central College Political Science account in just a second. An article uh, from The Atlantic by Graham Wood. And he looks at ISIS. And so if you're interested in this kind of question, read the article. Uh, and one of the connections he makes is between Hitler and George Orwell. So you've probably read George Orwell, 1984, Animal Farm, something along those lines. And so when Orwell read Hitler, he found Hitler strangely appealing. I think this helps us understand ISIS a little bit. Uh, Orwell describing Hitler, he says there's something deeply appealing about him. Hitler knows that human beings don't only want comfort, safety, short working hours, hygiene. They also, at least intermittently, want struggle and self-sacrifice. Not to mention drums, flags, and loyalty parades. You gotta love a good loyalty parade. All right, uh, fascism, right? So thinking about the comparison between ISIS, ISIS and fascism is psychologically far sounder than any hedonistic conception of life. Whereas socialism and even capitalism in a more grudging way have said to people, I offer you a good time. Hitler has said to them, I offer you struggle, danger, and death. And as a result, a whole nation flings itself at his feet. We ought not to underrate its emotional appeal. I think this goes a long way in explaining what's happening with ISIS right now. They're giving individuals a sense of identity, a sense of purpose, a sense of a broader commitment to society. And again, the recruiting numbers are small, but when you talk about 30,000 people, that's also a significant number. And when the United States thinks about confronting ISIS, I think we've been making a mistake. Far too often we engage on a theological level. So here's Obama saying that ISIS doesn't represent Islam, ISIS doesn't understand faith, that it's a misinterpretation of Islam. Again, that may be true, but I don't think that's effective. If you truly want to confront ISIS, I think you have to think at a psychological level. Think about what they're doing, how, what's the nature of their appeal, and how do you confront that approach? Don't, don't debate theology, but think about psychology. And again, that's from a political scientist. Uh, all right, that's all I have. Thank you.